Okay, so are you ready to like dive deep? Because uh, today we're really peeling back the layers on Warren Buffett. Okay. And you might think you know him, right? From all those financial headlines. Right. But trust me, there is more to the oracle of Omaha than meets the eye. Oh, absolutely. I think he's a fascinating figure with a lot of like unexpected dimensions to him. Exactly. Yeah. And our guide for this deep dive is an article by none other than James Altucher. Okay. Who wrote the book on Buffett. Literally. Well, at least that's what he claims. Right. You know, Altucher, yeah. always a bit of a character. A bit of a character, yes. A bold statement or two. So, yeah. Yeah. Not afraid of a little self-deprecating humor either. Not at all. No. Yeah. Um, but he kicks off this article by admitting he used to kind of... Will hate Buffett. He even accuses him of fear mongering to sell nuclear attack insurance. Oh my goodness gracious. Can you believe that? That's pretty out there. Yeah. It's pretty out there. It's a lot. Yeah, it's classic Al Toucher though, right? Yeah. Like playing the contrarian just to kind of pique your interest and suck you in. Totally works. It does. It's effective. It totally works. Yeah. But once you get past that initial shock, you start to see Buffett in a whole new light. Okay. For example, did you know that this multi-billionaire still lives in the same five-bedroom house he bought back in 1956 for a measly $31,500? That's wild. I did know that, actually. And it's incredible, especially when you compare it to someone like Bill Gates, right? Right. His bridge partner who's got that massive $150 million estate. Yeah. They like, talk about a study in contrast. It's not like he can't afford it. That's right. Right. <laughs> of course not. El Tucher really emphasizes the discipline angle yeah and it makes you think yeah. there's this great anecdote about buffett refusing to bet even a single dollar during a golf game oh, yeah. because it went against his like disciplined approach to money wow yeah you know that really speaks volumes i think about his long-term investment philosophy right yeah it's all about resisting those impulsive decisions even for really insignificant amounts totally like a dollar here a dollar there it can really add up but yeah. it makes you wonder is that legendary discipline the key to his success or just kind of a quirky byproduct? It's a real chicken or the egg Total. situation, isn't it? It is, yeah. But it definitely makes you stop and think about like your own relationship with discipline, even yeah. in those small everyday choices. Absolutely. It's powerful. Yeah. Like that reminder, I think, that success often comes down to consistency and making those small discipline choices day after day. Totally. Now, speaking of choices, ready for a bit of a curveball. Okay. What do you think was Warren Buffett's worst investment ever? Ooh. And I'll give you a hint. It's not what you'd expect. Okay. Um, I'm going to guess here. Okay. Was it like a tech startup in the early days? Good guess. Okay. But you're off the mark. Okay. It wasn't Conical Phillips where he lost a cool billion. Right. Or even those initial struggles of building Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. All right. You're going to have to put me out of my misery here. What was it? Believe it or not, it was a Sinclair gas station he bought back in 1951 with a friend. A gas station. Seriously. A gas station. That's not what I would have pictured right. for an investing type. It seems so ordinary. It really does. He even used to squeegee windows there on the weekends trying to drum up business. Oh, wow. But the Texaco station across the street, they ran him out of business. Oh, no. He lost $2,000, which back then was a pretty significant chunk of his savings. I bet, yeah. Yeah. It's almost hard to imagine someone like Warren Buffett experiencing that kind of setback. Right. You know, but it's a good reminder that everyone starts somewhere. And even like the most successful people have their share of early failures. Exactly. Yeah. And what's so fascinating is that Altucher speculates this early failure might have actually shaped the Buffett's later, more hands-off approach to investing. Interesting. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. It makes you think, did it make him more risk-averse? Did it force him to like really focus on truly understanding a business before investing? Yeah. It's amazing to think that such an early and seemingly insignificant experience could have such a profound impact on his investment philosophy. Yeah, it really makes you wonder how those early experiences, even the ones that seem small or insignificant at the time, you know, can really shape the trajectory of our lives. Absolutely. Sometimes those early setbacks can be the best learning experiences. Yeah. Now are you ready for another curveball? Okay. <laughs> what if I told you Warren Buffett was a Harvard reject? You know what? That's one that I've actually heard before. Mm -hmm. Although it's still pretty mind-blowing when you think about it, especially Harvard's track record with 
future billionaire. Right. Yeah. We hold Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and now Warren Buffett. Yeah. It makes you wonder if they have any admit stamps left over there. Right. <laughs> even like transferred back to his hometown college after starting at Wharton because he just wasn't a fan of the whole college scene. Interesting. Yeah, it really makes you question that traditional path to success, doesn't it? Right. I mean, here you have these individuals who are considered brilliant, innovative minds. Right. And they didn't fit the mold of the Ivy League system. Totally. It begs the question, does formal education always pave the way or can it sometimes hinder certain types of success? It's a question a lot of people grapple with, especially in today's world where there are so many different paths to success. Right. Speaking of unconventional journeys, this next bit is a real doozy. Did you know that Buffett was initially rejected for a job by his own mentor, Ben Graham? Oh, yes. I've heard this story. Yeah. And the reason behind it is quite surprising. To say the least. Yeah. So Graham, a Jewish man himself, wanted to reserve a spot at his firm for a Jewish person. Right. He was worried about the prejudice they faced on Wall Street at the time. Of course. It's a good reminder that even the most well-intentioned individuals can sometimes hold unconscious biases. Right. But what's truly remarkable is Buffett's persistence in the face of that rejection. Absolutely. He did not let that initial setback deter him. Yeah. He kept sending Graham investment ideas week after week, demonstrating his dedication and ultimately persuading Graham to hire him. Wow. It's a powerful testament to the importance of persistence. I Even, you. or maybe especially when we encounter obstacles in our path. Totally. What's something that you've persisted in? What was the result? That's a great question to reflect on. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of looking back, Altrich's article really got me thinking about Buffett's early days before he became a household name. Right. I mean, we all know the legendary investor. Right. But what was he like before the fame? It's always fascinating to kind of peek behind the curtain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See the journey before the destination. Exactly. And there's this book called Super Money by a writer using the pseudonym Adam Smith. Okay. And it actually profiled Buffett back in the 1960s before he was Warren Buffett, in all caps. Wow. And guess what? Al Tocher claims he is the reason it got republished. Typical Al Tocher, always taking credit where credit is due. Of course, why not? Or maybe not due. Right. But, you know, it really does highlight the value of studying the trajectories of these successful individuals. Yeah. What were those early indicators? What clues were there all along? Like that anecdote in the book where Buffett casually points out a furniture store from his car. Okay. And he says, I'm going to own that one day. Wow. And guess what? He actually ended up buying it later on. It's those kinds of details that make you realize that there's often a method to the perceived madness. Totally. Things that might seem random or lucky are often the result of you know, careful observations, strategic thinking, and just like a deep understanding of how things work. And speaking of understanding how things work, Altucher doesn't shy away from the more complex, even controversial chapters of Buffett's career. Right. Like that SEC investigation back in the 1970s. Ah, uh, yes, the penny stock manipulation yeah. allegations. Definitely a bump in the road for someone who is known for his ethical approach to business. Right. Yeah. And while Altucher doesn't condone it, he does point out that Buffett ultimately ended up paying a fine but wasn't charged with any crime. Right. It just goes to show that even financial titans aren't immune to scrutiny and that navigating the intricacies of the financial world can be a delicate dance. For sure. Hmm. It's a good reminder that reputation is a valuable asset. Yeah. Perhaps even more so than money in some cases. For sure. But now let's shift gears for a moment. Imagine, just for a second, trying to live like Warren Buffett for a week. <laughs> no computer, no cell phone, just you, your thoughts and 12 hours of bridge. That sounds both intriguing and terrifying at the same time. Mm -hmm. Though I have to admit, the idea of disconnecting from the constant digital noise does have a certain appeal. I hear you. Altucher seems to be suggesting that there's a certain zen-like quality to Buffett's approach to life. Yeah. A focus on the essentials and a dedication to strategic thinking. And that bridge playing isn't just a hobby. It's about strategy probability and understanding your opponent's moves. Right. Which, when you think about it, are all skills that translate quite well to the world of investing. Absolutely. So we've talked about his house, his habits, his setbacks, even his run-in with the SEC. But what does Warren Buffett himself consider to be the ultimate measure of success? Now, that's a question I'm eager to hear the answer to. It really makes you think about how we define success, doesn't it? Is it purely about like financial gain or are there other maybe more meaningful metrics at play? Yeah, it's a really profound question and one that I think we could all benefit from reflecting on. And it kind of raises another interesting point. If being loved 
is like Buffett's true measure of success. Mm -hmm. You know, how does that reconcile with some of his business dealings? I mean, the world of finance isn't exactly known for being warm and fuzzy, right? Right. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. Right. Exactly. That's the lingering question that Altucher leaves us with. Yeah. He mentions that Buffett could be pretty ruthless when it came to, like, closing a deal. Interesting. Almost like there's this unresolved tension between this desire to be loved and then the sometimes cutthroat nature of the business world. It's a fascinating <laughs> paradox, isn't it? Yeah. You have this image of Buffett as this kind of down-to-earth guy, right. someone who measures success by how many people love him, okay. yet at the same time, he's this shrewd businessman who's built an empire on making tough decisions. So where does that leave us? Is it even possible to be both successful and ethical in a world that often seems to reward ruthlessness? Or do we have to compromise our values in pursuit of our goals? Those are tough questions, and I don't think there's like well, an easy answer. Right. But I do believe that Buffett's story, even with all of its complexities and contradictions, really challenges us to examine our own definitions of success. Mm -hmm. You know, it prompts us to ask ourselves what truly matters. What are we willing to fight for? And what compromises are we willing to make or not make along the way? Yeah. It's a journey of self-discovery as much as a pursuit of achievement, wouldn't you say? Totally. And maybe that's like the most valuable lesson we can glean from Warren Buffett. Perhaps it is, because at the end of the day, success without fulfillment rings hollow. Totally. And maybe just maybe it is possible to achieve both. It's something to strive for, at least. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we'll wrap up this deep dive into the world of Warren Buffett. It's been fun. But remember, the conversation doesn't have to end here. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. What resonated with you? What surprised you? Let us know, because the best conversations are the ones that continue long after the episode ends. So true. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and as always, keep diving deep.